competition. But I, I will say this, um, 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 the boys, when he said about the black middle class, lots of this is written about the black middle class. They were used, that group, to feed both poor Negroes or poor black people in Philadelphia as well as whites. That's how he framed and captured them. They pretty, the black middle class, in many respects, still operates in the same way in the 21st century. All right? So they were this, they were this, 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 this funny little group in the middle. We didn't have the kind of class complexity that we have now. Is that there were loss of labor um, or manufacturing-based markets or jobs. What does that mean? What does that mean? Michael, we get caught up in jargon real fast, but what does that mean? It's like factories and stuff that used to be in the city but are already in the job. Absolutely. So, right, we're paying attention to all God's children. We're paying attention to um, 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 Claude Brown in, in the Promised Land, right? They're talking about what? Particularly Claude Brown, they're talking about um, um, going down to the garment industry. That's where they work in great bulk and great numbers, right? Those types of jobs, literally, you have to understand the psychology and the structural shift here. Literally, there was an opportunity in the United States of America where you can go work for a factory or you can work for some, some, some labor based market or some labor based industry. Industry, and you can take care of your whole family. You know, all you needed maybe was a high school diploma. You can provide jobs, you can provide um, um, cars for you and your wife, you can, you can send your, your child to college, you can get you a nice home in the suburbs, right? Not in the projects, but in the suburbs. Particularly if you got one of those nice car industry drives, one of those GM jobs, right? All of those jobs virtually were wiped away. A stroke of a pen, a stroke of policy. And we quickly, rapidly transition to what we refer to as a technology-based market. And that's what we're in now, right? So it's all about technology, right? If we're, if we're paying attention to Ecom, it's all about education, right? Because with educational opportunities and degrees and, and then certification and so forth and so on, then we have the opportunity to now participate in this technology-based market because it requires that, it requires an education. Or so that is the argument, I'm not totally sold on that. I would ultimately argue, at home isn't arguing this, but I would ultimately argue this, this shift, right, this rapid shift in the 1970s to a, to a technology-based market and, and, and the requirement of educational degrees to maintain uh, or to, to hire folk, that was more so a way to weed out poor black people. Poor black people. So shifting the markets, making it about all education, now stratifies our, our society in middle America in ways that we've never seen before. This became a legal and a moral way to leave out poor black people. Uh, another thing about the, um, about the manufacturing thing, the industries were moving towards this uh, more technological advanced, I guess, way of thinking. The, the other part that, that made it so hurtful, I guess, to, to poor black communities was the fact that it's not like we still don't need factories to make yeah. stuff. No matter what, yeah. how technologically savvy you get, you know, to make the camera, you still need somebody to make the parts of the camera. It was the fact that you now have a large amount of outsourcing to other nations that also kind of crippled that market. So not that factories got done away with per se, it's that factories yeah. in yeah. America yeah. got done yeah. away with. Yeah. Yeah. And factories did start to pop up all around the nation where they could pay, you know, for labor much cheaper than they could. Yeah, totally, totally. Great point, great point. This became a legal and a moral way to leave out poor black people. Guess who we had at the head of all of that? Promoting that idea. This newly, which we just talked about all, really all semester, but definitely last class, this new black middle class, right? Because now we don't have the excuse anymore. It's kind of like the Barack Obama effect. We got a black president, so you can't make any more excuses no more. It's totally up to you. I don't buy that. Just because we have a black president, we still got real issues. And just because he made it doesn't mean that the bulk of masses can. And we can't lose sight of that. But that's what definitely happened in the 1970s. So you had this, this major shift, right? And now we have this major uh, uh, new black middle class that comes on board, and they're at the helm, just like they are in Black Reconstruction, and which this is what Du Bois is talking about in Philadelphia Negro, and other books like Souls of Black Folk, and even Black Reconstruction, right? He says the black middle class would eventually Right? Particularly after they were, were provided certain opportunities, were eventually used to leave out their own people. Because they're, those are the folk that are marshalling these arguments. 
this in mind. The reason why I'm referring to this as the infamous, or Carl and I are referring to this as the infamous 1970s analysis, because although this is true, although we would agree that this is predictive to some extent, to some real extent, of black men in the streets today, right? However, if we get totally sucked into this argument, right, so most scholars would argue street life is here because of this. And I'm arguing, and this course is arguing, that that's not true. Street life was around centuries before at concentrated levels. Not to say that this wasn't predictive, I think this was an X, this is an excellent analysis. But this is not the predicting analysis for street life today. And if you read the literature, they would say, it's, it's the mythic past again, um, um, which is really the next slide, I'm not going to get into it. But point is this, that um, um, they're essentially arguing that before the 1970s, everything was great. But when we ran up to the 1970s, right, and we ran across these issues, I went backwards when I go forward. Oh, I did go backwards, excuse me. Um, 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 but we went to, the, to these issues, and all of a sudden, we, these kids became street. Right? And I think that is an oversimplified analysis of what's going on. More important, it's dangerous and it's dismissing an entire people's history in exchange for an artificial history. Right? This mythic past. All right. Mind, Tupac Shakur, interestingly enough, my other class I played this song um, um, in regards to this very point. But um, at the time, 1990 session, he dies in 96. But um, at the time he re released the song, actually he didn't release it when he was alive. I think it was released after, I believe. It actually records it before he dies. But in any event, um, um, he didn't even die since he's still alive. But in any event, um, um, he, he created a song, wrote a song um, um, called Letters for President. And it was to Bill Clinton. And it's one of the most fiery, most angry. Um, um, this is a time when black America is heralding Bill Clinton. He is a hero. He's first black president. He's all it is. And Tupac on behalf of inner city black America, man, he tears right into Bill Clinton. He's like, you're not my friend, you're not the friend of my community, and, um, and, and as far as I'm concerned, there is no opportunity out here for black people, because everywhere I look, you know what I mean, there are drugs being sold, and there's unemployment, and there are you know, hard times. So um, whenever you get a chance, we, 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 we listen to it another class, we don't have time in this class, but let it to the president. He does